there! Welcome to Skin Key Productions. I'm Crown Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about the recent Ukraine crisis with regard to Russia and like uh, NATO. We're also going to be talking about China as well. And in general, we're talking about the topic of geopolitics, right? So if you've never heard about geopolitics before, this video will hopefully uh, explain some of the things and some of the kind of dynamics of it. But we're also going to do something which is, you know, like I said in my last video, combining geopolitics with my love of four-way chess. Now, if you've never played four-way chess before, definitely give it a, a check out. Uh, and for most of the video, uh, we're going to be having a game uh, which I've played and stuff, uh, just so you kind of get a bit of an a, a idea for it and stuff, right? So, that being said, we're going to dive into the video now. But before we do that, don't forget to obviously hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, now let's just get on to the, the video, right? Right, so within this year, we're going to be talking, first of all, about George Orwell's 1984. Now, people often like talk about it in terms of totalitarian regimes and stuff, and that's that's a part of it, right? However, an interesting bit that uh, uh, Orwell did was talking about what the world would look like yeah, in 1984. So within that, you have uh, Oceania, uh, which is basically, well, as you can see on like, the map here and stuff, it's basically Britain, the Americas, and like Australia and stuff, right? And like the, uh, Southern Africa. Uh, then uh, you have uh, East Asia, which is basically China, uh, kind of like uh, Southeast Asia and like kind of you know, Japan, etc, etc. And then you have Eurasia, which is basically uh, Russia, like the former Soviet Union, uh, taking a bit of like Turkey as well. And then going all the way uh, to uh, basically throughout like, the whole of uh, mainland Europe. Right. So that's essentially what like the like uh, uh, he kind of thought like, the world would look like, or at least was warning what the world could end up looking like. Right. So. What's interesting about this, yeah, right, is twofold. First of all, he makes the point that each of these, like, three superpowers are so strong that neither one can, like, take out the other and stuff, right? So it's kind of, they're, they're, they might constantly be in conflict with each other, but they're not strong enough to be able to completely, like, get rid of the other one, right? Like, you know, you're not going to be able to fully occupy uh, Eurasia, you're not going to be able to fully occupy uh, East Asia, you're not going to be able to fully occupy Oceania, right? And also as well, it also talks about how like their, their uh, competing like kind of interests yeah, change over time. And this ties in with a quote that Churchill made, yeah, which is, there are no uh, lasting friends, no lasting enemies, just lasting interests, right? So each nation has its own national interest and you know, its relationship with other nations might chop and change over time, but those interests still stay the same. So this is kind of what we covered in some other videos as well. But like, yeah, so in this video, we're going to like kind of dive into this a little bit more like in terms of the specifics of it. So within 1984, at the beginning of the book, it says that Oceania, uh, which is where uh, the, the protagonist uh, Winston Smith is based, right? It says that Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia and has always been allied with East Asia. But he remembers a time about five years before uh, uh, the book was set, right? Where Oceania was at war with East Asia and was allied with Eurasia, right? Like, and people kind of just pretended like this never happened. And then somewhere within like the middle of the book, suddenly changes again. So instead of like Oceania has always been at war with uh, Eurasia, the new line is Oceania has always been at war with East Asia and has always been allied with Eurasia. So that's essentially what it, and if I've got that confused, I've, it's been a long time since I've read 1984, so forgive me, right? The point of it is, regardless of like how it chops and changes, yeah, the point is that it chops and changes. So we can see this phenomenon, yeah, within our own history. So if you look over the last 300 years, right, if we look at, for instance, uh, the War of Spanish Succession, uh, so in that war there, England is allied with Prussia against Austria and also against France, etc., etc., right? However, in the Austrian War of Succession, Prussia is Britain's enemy and Austria is her ally. A few years later, you end up having the Seven Years' War, right? So Prussia ends up being allied with Britain and Austria is the enemy. Fast forward now to the Napoleonic Wars and Prussia and Austria are allies with uh, Britain against France as was mainly the case in many of these earlier conflicts, right? France is the kind of the major threat that everyone was kind of worried about. Then, fast forward now to World War I, and what ends up becoming Germany, yeah, which kind of comes out of Prussia, is our enemy, and Germany and Austria end up being allied against us. So you can see within a very short amount of time, well, it's a few centuries and stuff, yeah, but you can see just how much it chops and changes. You can also see the same with regard to our relationship with Russia, you can see it with our relationship with uh, France as well, and bear this in mind as well, that within uh, George Orwell's lifetime, right, 
even three years before like, 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 like him actually kind of uh, uh, writing 1984, right? So in the space of 1945 to 1948, we'd gone from dropping bombs on the Germans from planes to dropping like food supplies to them by plane, right? This is the Berlin airlift. You know, so it kind of shows that like, you know, Germany, which have been our staunch enemy, right? And, you know, we were fighting against them aligned with the Russians, right? And the Russians were our great friends, you know, led by Uncle Joe, yeah, Joe Stalin, right? And in the space of a very short map of time, that completely flipped, right? So we end up being allied with the, the Germans, or rather the West Germans, and the Soviet Union was the enemy, right? Russia was the enemy. And now, if you kind of look at it as well, like kind of, it, things keep changing. So, for instance, yeah, when uh, China went communist, you know, China ended up being our enemy. You know, so we end up being opposed to both uh, Red China and also Red Russia. But when they end up being the Sino-Soviet split in the mid 60s, then in the, uh, the early 70s, there's a famous thing where Nixon goes to China. So Nixon goes to China because he's trying to get the Chinese on the American side. And so throughout the rest of the Cold War, you end up having basically, uh, you know, America and like the West and stuff allied with uh, China against the Soviet Union. So you basically ally yourself with another communist power in order to take out, uh, you know, the main communist power, right? So why am I saying all this here? Like, like what, 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 what was, like, why, why, why am I saying all this? It's because it kind of shows you how much things can chop and change. As much as like people might like to, you know, in a fairy tale world, we might like foreign policy to be all about like, you know, fluffy puppies and rainbows and stuff. In reality, that's not how the world actually operates, right? So within international relations, so when I was a student, uh, I studied politics and international relations at University of Southampton. So I know a little bit what I'm talking about, not, not that much, but I know a little bit. So you have two competing uh, main like schools of thought, right? One of them being the liberal internationalist uh, school of thought, and the other being the realist school for and obviously you have neoliberalism and you have neo realism etc etc it kind of gets very complex right but broadly i would say i fall more into the uh, kind of uh, uh, the the realist camp right uh, so people like uh, mirsheimer you know like, like uh, he's he's really good if you look at uh, one of his uh, talks about uh, the ukraine and like russia and stuff right really really good highly recommend that and also as well, there's another commentator uh, called uh, Vladimir Pozna. Uh, uh, really check out his uh, 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 lecture where, where he's basically talking about, uh, you know, how the West created Putin, right? So within that, you kind of, you get, you know, if you look at that, you kind of go, okay, right. If you watch those two like uh, uh, talks, then you will understand what, it, you know, the Russians are doing, yeah, from their own perspective. Because if all you do is just like watch BBC and watch CNN, you're going to get a very pro-Western perspective, right? And that might be right or might be wrong, but in order to understand anything, you have to hear both sides out and be like, okay, this is why the Russians are doing that. Because if you look at it just from a Western perspective, what's happening in Ukraine at the moment is not going to make any sense to you. But if you look at it from a Russian perspective, it makes complete sense, right? But we're going to get into that a little bit later. And how we're going to get into that is through the medium of four-way chess. So as obviously you can see on screen at the moment, yeah, I'm in the middle of like playing uh, this uh, uh, chess game and stuff. And yo, know, it's like four way chess is mad. Like, like if you played chess before, like, like kind of, and you think you're good at it, I highly recommend you play like a, a four way chess because it's a complete kind of game changer, right? It's not like normal chess at all. Uh, and you have to watch out for all different things coming from everywhere. And just, it's mad, yeah, it's mad. And, and there's lots of tactics and it's just crazy, right? But I'd say that there's, after playing it for almost like a year now, right? I think there's five main principles, yeah, to stick with, with regard to uh, a four-way chess and also with regard to uh, geopolitics. And it's this. Rule number one, no one can survive a three-way attack. So, for instance, on the board here, okay, cool. So I'm playing here. I want to cover up the other people just because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to put their names on it and stuff, right? Uh, just for any kind of copyright, whatever. So, basically, on screen now, imagine I am the West, right? Then on one side, I have China. And on the other side, I have Russia, right? And then what Orwell kind of said with regard to like, you know, uh, Oceania, East Asia and Eurasia, right? First of all, obviously the borders are not exactly as like he kind of predicted, yeah, because obviously with the Cold War, et cetera, like, you know, NATO is, you know, much like bigger than, than like he kind of anticipated to be. And it's all kind of levels of complication and stuff, yeah. But broadly speaking, I would say that like, this is kind of accurate, yeah, especially when you look at, the, the parts of the world which are not kind of controlled by either major power and which are being competed over, right? 
And this is essentially what we would call the third world, right? Now, the third world, I would say, is the other side of that as well, right? Now, the third world, obviously, is very, very, like, broad. You know, you've got so many different cultures. You've got the vast majority of the human population living there. And, yeah, so, but because each of these states are weak and, like, you know, people that are poor, et cetera, et cetera, the third world, as much as they try to kind of, like, coalesce with the kind of, like, non-aligned movement and stuff, it's quite a weak force on the international stage. But we'll put it in anyway because it kind of, yeah. Um, so... For instance, if we look, at, we're in the last like 30 years, right? So from the West perspective, the Soviet Union was the major threat in like the, in like the 1980s, right? China was quite poor, but it was still kind of a threat. It's still someone to be taken seriously. And then in the third world, you had all these different like proxy wars that were being fought like in Afghanistan and et cetera, et cetera, right? So that was the kind of situation in the 1980s. Then the Soviet Union collapsed, right? And part of the reason why it collapsed is, well, obviously because of internal uh, issues, but also it's because of this kind of, three on one attack right so this is the west this is uh china and this is much of the third world yeah basically being like brought to bear on like the uh, on like the soviet union so with this basically three on one uh, attack combined with like their own like domestic kind of like uh, issues soviet union collapses right the soviet union is no longer a major threat to the west so this is where you have like u.s hegemony yeah right so we've done a video on this you know american hegemony this is pax americana so in this time, you would have thought that like they would have been a bit more humble and a bit more kind of thinking like long term and stuff, right? Instead, what ended up happening in the 1990s and in the 2000s is end up getting bogged down in the third world, right? I.e. the war on terror. So we spent trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, yeah, right? On what? Like, like chasing after a few people run back Kalashnikovs in the hills of Afghanistan and in like the deserts of Iraq. Is that a really good uh, use of money? Probably not. Meanwhile, while we were like doing that and being bogged down with all that, China was slowly rising, right? Or like, no, rather, it was rapidly rising, right? It's rapidly industrializing. And now China is the number one economy in the world. So, you know, while we were kind of focusing there, we kind of took the eyes off the ball with regard to China, right? And so by the time uh, uh, the, uh, the Obama administration talks about let's do this kind of pivot to Asia, right? I think we did that in like 2013. By that point there, it was kind of too late, yeah, right? So, you know, so that's why America now has been trying to pull out of the Middle East. That's why, you know, what happened in Afghanistan, it kind of was like, oh, okay, whatever this is, what it is. But the main thing is, you know, uh, containing China, right? And that's the one of the things. But the problem with many of the kind of liberal internationalists, yeah, is because they're idealist, yeah, they think about, you know, the whole world, right? And they kind of think about, oh, we could just spread like freedom and democracy around the whole world and et cetera, et cetera, and basically impose Western values on the rest of the world. And the rest of the world doesn't like, you know, they don't like that, right? The rest of the world doesn't operate in that way. So each country and rather each civilization, yeah, like kind of like, because each country has its own history going way, way back. And the, the state that country's at the moment is as a result of their history, right? So, for instance, you know, Ian Duncan Smith more recently, uh, I have a lot of respect for him, good man. Yeah. However, recently he said that Russia and China are part of the new axis of evil. Now, the problem is that, as we see with regard to uh, Orwell 1984, Oceania, right, or the West, yeah, can't take on Russia and China simultaneously, right? And on top of that, all the kind of like despots in like the third world and stuff like who are not allies to us, we're not going to be able to take them all on, right? So if we have this kind of evangelizing kind of mission where it's like, oh, we're going to try and spread this thing. No, 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 it doesn't work that way, yeah? If people want those values and people want to adopt Western values, they will choose to adopt those Western values, yeah? But we shouldn't be naive enough to assume that, like, you know, we can just, like, in, in, like pop and paste things and just put them anywhere, right? This is why... Yeah, many of the kind of neocons, yeah, when they were talking about uh, like Iraq and Afghanistan, they was like, okay, cool. What we'll do is we'll invade, we'll take out the people who are there, and then we'll set up a, a democracy and everything will be like puppies and rainbows, right? And actually, they used the copy and paste model of Germany and Italy and Japan after World War II. But in all three of those societies, before the war, and before the rise of fascism, they already had fully functioning democratic societies. So all you had to basically do once the war was over was say, Right, we're just going to reinstate what you guys had like 20 years ago, right? And so people have been living in uh, memory, you know, they, those institutions were still there. And so they was like, okay, cool, right? We understand, yeah, it's cool. But 
somewhere like Afghanistan, which has never had a history of that, somewhere like Iraq, which has never had a history of that, you can't just assume that just because you've said, right, there's going to be a democracy there, that all of a sudden there's going to be a democracy. It doesn't work like that, right? And similarly as well, like this kind of naivety, yeah, we, which you saw during this Pax Americana era, where they go, oh, right, yeah, it's fine. You know, the rise of China, you know, China becoming more capitalist, it's fine because eventually they're going to become Western, right? And the same thing with the Soviet Union, yeah, like, yeah, okay, so Russia's like, is now, you know, the you know, Soviet Union's collapsed, Russia is now going to, going to become, you know, liberal and democratic and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, like, like, because that shows a fundamental lack of understanding about the different civilizations that they're from, right? So anyway, sorry, I've spoken a lot about uh, rule number one, which is no one can survive a three on one attack. Rule number two is to focus on the main threat at that time, right? So for instance, in the 1980s, it didn't make sense to focus on China and the third world because the main threat was the Soviet Union. Now in 2022, yeah, Russia's doing what it's doing in Ukraine and yeah, this is going on here and yes, that's going on there, et cetera, et cetera. But the main threat to the West comes from China. China is investing everywhere, it's setting up bases places, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in, in, increasing its military, it's threatening Taiwan, it's threatening many places in, in its own like back garden and stuff. Yeah? And the, the point is, so I said back garden, I meant backyard, same difference, right, whatever. <laughs> but the point is that we're getting distracted by focusing on this and that and that and that, but the main threat from a Western perspective is China. So if anything, all those other things are kind of peripheral and the main thing that we should be focusing on at the moment is China. Rule number three follows on from rule number two, which is that threats can change over time. So just because someone is a threat now doesn't mean that they're going to be a threat in, 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 in a few years time. And just because someone's not a threat now doesn't mean that they're not going to be later on, right? So many of our leaders, yeah, many of them, well, like they're just old and like they just have an old way of thinking. So many of them grew up in the 1980s. And so they go, Russia bad, right? Uh, so their thinking is still stuck in that mindset of like Russia bad, Russia is the main threat. But Russia has an economy the same size as Italy, right? And China, like we said, is the most powerful uh, country on earth in terms of its economy at the moment, yeah? It has the largest population and it's being very, very aggressive. So the real threat is China now, but because our leaders haven't like caught up with that and because like, our establishment haven't caught up, up with that, they still go, ah, but Russia is the main threat. And also because Russia is kind of closer to the West than China, they kind of, you know, so when you're playing four-way chess, yeah, it's easy to kind of be like, okay, right, we're going to attack the people on either side, yeah. You don't necessarily at early stage want to attack your opposite, yeah, because then you end up invoking the wrath of all three people. People in like four-way chess tend to like gang up on people and stuff, right? Especially if you're on this side, this person or that person is going to get, get, get like ganged up upon. So you kind of want to attack the people either side of you. But the thing is, if you focus too much on trying to take out one person, right, the whole time you have to be watching the whole board, right? You have to be looking out for where the next threat could come because if you're in the middle of trying to take out this person here. Meanwhile, like you might have like your queen out there and, and like she's about to like do some finishing move. However, this person's here with their queen and in the next move, they're going to get you checkmated, right? So even at the cost of you losing your queen, you need to defend your king. Yeah? You don't want to get checkmated, right? If you stay in the game, you're going to have to, at all times, yeah, be on the defensive, right? That's the main, main thing. And also as well on that point, yeah, right? This is why rule number four is this, right? Which is there are no permanent allies, right? When you're playing four-way chess, just because this person here seems to be attacking the same person that you're attacking, right? Doesn't mean you can trust that person because at any time you're still attacking here, They've lined it up and without you even realizing, bang, they've taken you out, right? And if you if you are not like conscious of that, you will get taken out of the game very, very quickly. Even someone who's your opposite, right? You might be like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, you know, I, uh, he's the opposite and like, yeah, he's taking out this person and yeah, we're working together, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden they can go bang. Yeah, I've had so many games just end like that, yeah. But, but the person who you least expect is actually the one who's going to be the one to stab the knife in, right? So that's what you have to kind of be like bear in mind, right? So even if we ally with this person or with that country, et cetera, et cetera, we have to always bear in mind at any point they could turn on us, right? And vice versa. So that's something to really bear in mind. And this ties in with the fifth and final rule, which is never focus on one person too much, right? So for instance, I'm saying here like, you know, the West should pivot towards like focusing on China. However, if we focus all of our energy on China, 
then Russia might end up rising. Then certain people like in the, in the third world might end up rising as well, right? And vice versa, right? So so whoever it is, you always got to be conscious of that. So for instance, from Russia's perspective, yeah, they might be like, oh, okay, we're gonna gang up with with China now against the West. But at the same time, they also have to bear in mind that China shares a border with Russia as well. So you know, Russia might be looking westwards, but at the same time, there might be an attack from the east. So this is something as well, yeah, with regard to Russia. So you know, Churchill said like the famous thing of like something along the lines of, you know, Russia is an enigma inside of a puzzle inside of a maze. And basically he's basically trying to say that Russia is really confused and really complicated. And it's not, right? So each kind of society has its own kind of building block, its own kind of like slogans, its own kind of values and such, right? And during the time of the Tsars, they had one which was orthodoxy, autarky, and nationalism, right? So or rather those are three, but you know what I mean? They have a, a slogan which include those three principles. You know, so orthodoxy, you know, that's with regard to like the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, uh, autarky, that's to do with the Tsar and like, kind of like the, you know, the whole thing of like, you know, the Tsar is like in charge or everything, right? And the third one is nationalism. Yes, this is Russification. Yeah, this is, you know, Russia trying to expand itself in its own self-interest. So those are the three uh, principles that Russia had back in the Tsarist days. But even when you look at the Soviet Union, you had a new orthodoxy, yeah, which is Marxism, which is Bolshevism, right? Which they tried to spread to the rest of the world, right? And then with regard to autocracy, apologies if I said autarky earlier, I meant autocracy. With regard to uh, uh, autocracy, right? So, you know, uh, Stalin was basically a red czar, right? So it's still continuing that same kind of thing of like, he's basically, you know, he's, 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 he still is a uh, autocracy. It's just a different person in charge of it. And then also with nationalism, while the Soviet Union pretended to be all this kind of, yeah, it's this cosmopolitan place and we respect all nationalities, in reality, what it was was Russification, like just under the radar, right? So, the, you know, the Russian people, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, imposed their culture on different places, uh, they, they settled in different places, et cetera, et cetera. So it was still Russification just under the guise of, oh, it's just international brotherhood and stuff, and all this right, nonsense, right? So Russia, for instance, as emblem, has the two-headed eagle, right? So one uh, head is going westward and the other going eastward. Now, what Russia wants more than anything is respect, right? Throughout all of its history, it's been a European power. Yes, there was a time when obviously the Mongols took it over and that's why their culture kind of like changed and, and etc. We've covered that in other videos. But the point is that with regard to Russia, they want to be part of the European family and yet you know, because of racism and because of just bigotry in general, right? Europeans have always looked at them as Asiatic, right? The kind of Asiatic hordes, as people used to kind of say. And so, you know, for them, like, for instance, like, uh, you know, uh, Boris Johnson, yeah, like uh, in a book he did a few years ago, he was basically pointing out that, uh, you know, the European Union, yeah, those people who are really in support of it, the Europhiles, if you ask them about Russia joining the EU, they're totally opposed to it. Yeah, it's like, hold on, I thought you you're pro Europe. Yeah, like so so Russia's a European country. You know, vast majority of its population lives within European Russia. So why why do you not want Russia to join the EU? And they'll come up with like, oh, it's because of like blah 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 values and blah blah. The real reason is because Russia joining the EU would completely tip the balance. Yeah, towards like yeah, away from Germany and away from France, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the countries on the continent would be greatly diminished by this kind of behemoth. Yeah, which is Russia. Similarly as well, well, for different reasons, yeah, both Stalin and Putin both asked to join NATO, right? Now, think about what NATO was founded for. It was founded in order to, to stop like, the, the spread of the, of the Soviet Union and to basically be a defensive block against that. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, why did NATO then expand here, yeah, like kind of, uh, uh, you know, like in the 90s, in, the, uh, in like the noughties and in like the, the, uh, the 2010s, right? So if it was just this kind of anti-communist block, why is it expanding? And why can't Russia join? Yeah, <laughs> surely like they're no longer a major threat and stuff, right? And Putin for many years, you know, before the, the whole thing happened in, in Georgia in 2008, you know, the years before that, Putin was, it wasn't a perfect guy, he had lots of problems domestically, but he wasn't this kind of mad tyrant who's like trying to invade places and stuff, yeah, that, that we kind of see today. He was very kind of different in many ways right much more you know and that's because he was trying to like 
be on the good side with the West, right? But it got to a point where he's like, you guys keep expanding eastwards. You said that you wouldn't. You said that NATO wouldn't expand one inch to the east. And yet, look, you guys are on our border. So what's going on with all that? So Russia just wants respect. And if the West doesn't give it respect, it's going to look eastwards, right? That's why Russia and China are now aligned themselves more. So what I'm basically saying is in order to basically I think more strategically, yeah, because the thing is, we're never going to take out China, we're never going to take out Russia, we're never going to take out like kind of the third world in general, right? These civilizations, these blocks, and to talk about the third world, like I said, it's all different cultures, so please don't kind of overly quote me on that. It's, you know, you understand what I'm basically trying to get at, right? It's the thing of we need to have respect for each place, but also we have to understand that these places aren't going anywhere. We're not going to be able to completely defeat them, right? There's no final victories, there's no final defeats, right? So that, that means that we're going to have to work with these different competing powers. So now it makes more sense to, rather than being like super focused on like Putin and being like, oh no, he's invading Ukraine. Ukraine up until 30 years ago was part of the Soviet Union and it had been part of like the Russian empire for 300 years beforehand. So if Putin moves into Eastern Ukraine, or even if he takes over the whole of Ukraine, does that really pose such a geopolitical uh, threat yeah, to Britain and to America and to other places in Europe? Really, like kind of like, like you know, it, like it, it, it's not the end of the world. Obviously, yeah, it's sad for the people of Ukraine, but like at the end of the day, it's the global chessboard, yeah. So again, whether we like it or not, this is just how the world is. Like, if we could wave a magic wand and everyone would become angels, then then that would be great. But, like, as it is at the moment, people are just, yeah, it's, it's the global chessboard, so source to Ukraine. However, for instance, if Putin went from Ukraine and then tried to invade Poland, that's a different story because now, like, uh, the West heartland is now starting to be, like, really, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, threatened and stuff, yeah, by an expansive Russia. But what... I think we should do in the West is basically in the same way Nixon went to China. I think that, you know, a, a US president, I don't think Biden's likely to do it. Um, but like, you know, so you need basically a Western leader with a lot of clout to go to Russia and to try and treat them with respect. Yeah, like kind of, uh, and, and de-escalate tensions there. Maybe even if possible, allow them to join NATO, right? But obviously, keep a watch out for them because, you know, as they're saying Russian, you know, oh, I should have, I'm learning Russian here. I was partly to do with this kind of thing of trying to improve relations, but I can't remember the exact thing. I have it on screen now. And there's basically in English, it's trust but verify. So allow Russia to become part of NATO, but also keep an eye out that they're not doing some shady stuff and trying to destabilize NATO from within, right? But I think that in terms of the coming conflict with, uh, with, uh, with China, right, it makes more sense for Russia to be part of the West, right, and we kind of just go, yeah, cool, you're part of the, 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 the European family now, you're part of the Western family now, right? You know, basically take Russia out the cold. And then with that, you're no longer fighting three different forces, you're now just fighting two, potentially, right? And realistically, you're just fighting one. So that's what I would suggest on a like geostrategic kind of like a, 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 a world basis, right? This is what the West should do moving forward. But that's just me. I'm just, I'm one guy. Like, so let me know in the comment section what you think uh, should be done and what you think about like what, kind of what I've said here. And uh, yes, yeah, so the next video is going to be on how should history be taught in school? So I've worked in schools, I've obviously been a student and I didn't like how history was taught. I don't think it's very reflective of how people actually consume history. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about that and how I kind of think it should be done. Uh, so yeah, so definitely stay tuned for that. And if you haven't uh, hit the like button already, if you haven't subscribed, definitely uh, don't forget to do that because that's just a major win. Like, like you're winning in life if you do that. So with all that being said, have a great day and bye.